trade was an inconvenience which would have sufficiently balanced the repeal of all the acts complained of, had such repeals been obtained. But if the whole continent must take up arms, if every man must be a soldier, it is scarcely worth our while to fight against a contemptible ministry only. Dearly, dearly do we pay for the repeal of the acts, if that is all we fight for, for in a just estimation it is as great a folly to pay a Bunker Hill price for law as for land. As I have always considered the independency of this continent as an event, which sooner or later must arrive, so from the late rapid progress of the continent to maturity, the event could not be far off. Wherefore, on the breaking out of hostilities, it was not worth while to have disputed a matter, which time would have finally redressed, unless we meant to be in earnest. Otherwise, it is like wasting an estate on a suited law, to regulate the trespasses of a tenant, whose lease is just expiring. No man was a warmer wisher for reconciliation than myself before the fatal 19th of April, 1775. But the moment the event of that day was made known, I rejected the hardened, sullen-tempered Pharaoh of England for ever, and disdained the wretch that with the pretended title of father of his people can unfeelingly hear of their slaughter and composedly sleep with their blood upon his soul. By admitting that matters were now made up, what would be the event? I answer, the ruin of the continent, and that for several reasons. First, the powers of governing still remaining in the hands of the king, he will have a negative over the whole legislation of this continent. And as he hath shown himself such an inveterate enemy to liberty, and discovered such a thirst for arbitrary power, is he, or is he not, a proper man to say to these colonies, You shall make no laws but what I please? And is there any inhabitant in America so ignorant as not to know that according to what is called the present Constitution, that this continent can make no laws but what the king gives leave to? And is there any man so unwise as not to see that, considering what has happened, he will suffer no law to be made here but such as suit his purpose? We may be as effectually enslaved by the want of laws in America as by submitting to laws made for us in England. After matters are made up, as it is called, can there be any doubt but the whole power of the crown will be exerted to keep this continent as low and humble as possible? Instead of going forward, we shall go backward, or be perpetually quarrelling or ridiculously petitioning. We are already greater than the king wishes us to be, and will he not hereafter endeavour to make us less? To bring the matter to one point, is the power who is jealous of our prosperity a proper power to govern us? Whoever says no to this question is an independent, for independency means no more than whether we shall make our own laws, or whether the king, the greatest enemy this continent hath or can have, shall tell us, there shall be no laws but such as I like. But the king, you say, has a negative in England. The people there can make no laws without his consent. In point of right and good order, there is something very ridiculous that a youth of twenty-one, which hath often happened, shall say to several millions of people older and wiser than himself, I forbid this or that act of yours to be law. But in this place I decline this sort of reply, though I will never cease to expose the absurdity of it, and only answer that England, being the king's residence, and America not so, makes quite another case. The king's negative here is ten times more dangerous and fatal than it can be in England, 
for there he will scarcely refuse his consent to a bill for putting England into as strong a state of defense as possible, and in America he would never suffer such a bill to be passed. America is only a secondary object in the system of British politics. England consults the good of this country no farther than it answers her own purpose. Wherefore, her own interest leads her to suppress the growth of ours in every case which doth not promote her advantage, or in the least interferes with it. A pretty state we should soon be in under such a second-hand government considering what has happened. Men do not change from enemies to friends by the alteration of a name. And in order to show that reconciliation now is a dangerous doctrine, I affirm that it would be policy in the king at this time to repeal the acts for the sake of reinstating himself in the government of the provinces, in order that he may accomplish by craft and subtlety in the long run what he cannot do by force and violence in the short one. Reconciliation and ruin are nearly related. Secondly, that as even the best terms which we can expect to obtain can amount to no more than a temporary expedient, or a kind of government by guardianship, which can last no longer than till the colonies come of age, so the general face and state of things in the interim will be unsettled and unpromising. Immigrants of property will not choose to come to a country whose form of government hangs but by a thread, and who is every day tottering on the brink of commotion and disturbance, and numbers of the present inhabitants would lay hold of the interval to dispense of their effects and quit the continent. But the most powerful of all arguments is that nothing but independence, that is, a continental form of government, can keep the peace of the continent and preserve it inviolate from civil wars. I dread the event of a reconciliation with Britain now, as it is more than probable that it will be followed by a revolt somewhere or other, the consequences of which may be far more fatal than all the malice of Britain. Thousands are already ruined by British barbarity. Thousands more will probably suffer the same fate. Those men have other feelings than us who have nothing suffered. All they now possess is liberty. What they before enjoyed is sacrificed to its service. And, having nothing more to lose, they disdain submission. Besides, the general temper of the colonies towards a British government will be like that of a youth who is nearly out of his time. They will care very little about her. And a government which cannot preserve the peace is no government at all. And in that case we pay our money for nothing. And pray, what is it that Britain can do, whose power will be wholly on paper, should a civil tumult break out the very day after reconciliation? I have heard some men say, many of whom I believe spoke without thinking, that they dreaded an independence, fearing that it would produce civil wars. It is but seldom that our first thoughts are truly correct, and that is the case here, for there are ten times more to dread from a patched-up connection than from independence. I make the sufferer's case my own, and I protest that were I driven from house and home, my property destroyed, and my circumstances ruined, that, as a man sensible of injuries, I should never relish the doctrine of reconciliation, or consider myself bound thereby. The colonies have manifested such a spirit of good order and obedience to continental government, as is sufficient to make every reasonable person easy and happy on that head. No man can assign the least pretense for his fears on any other grounds than such as are truly childish and ridiculous, viz., that one colony will be striving for superiority over another. 
Where there are no distinctions, there can be no superiority. Perfect equality affords no temptation. The republics of Europe are all, and we may say always, in peace. Holland and Switzerland are without wars, foreign or domestic. Monarchical governments, it is true, are never long at rest. The crown itself is a temptation to enterprising ruffians at home, and that degree of pride and insolence ever attendant on regal authority swells into a rupture with foreign powers in instances where a republican government, by being formed on more natural principles, would negotiate the mistake. If there is any true cause of fear respecting independence, it is because no plan is yet laid down. Men do not see their own way out. Wherefore, as an opening into that business, I offer the following hints, at the same time modestly affirming that I have no other opinion of them myself than that they may be the means of giving rise to something better. Should the straggling thoughts of such individuals be collected, they would frequently form materials for wise and able men to improve into useful matter. Let the assemblies be annual, with a president only, the representation more equal, their business wholly domestic and subject to the authority of a continental congress. Let each colony be divided into six, eight, or ten convenient districts, each district to send a proper number of delegates to Congress, so that each colony send at least thirty. The whole number in Congress will be at least three hundred and ninety. Each Congress to sit and to choose a president by the following method. When the delegates are met, let a colony be taken from the whole thirteen colonies by lot, after which let the whole Congress choose by ballot a president from out of the delegates of that province. In the next Congress, let a colony be taken by lot from twelve only, omitting that colony from which the president was taken in the former Congress, and so proceeding on till the whole thirteen shall have had their proper rotation. And, in order that nothing may pass into a law but what is satisfactorily just, not less than three-fifths of the Congress to be called a majority. He that will promote discard, under a government so equally formed as this, would have joined Lucifer in his revolt. But, as there is a peculiar delicacy, from whom or in what manner this business must first arise, and as it seems most agreeable and consistent, that it should come from some intermediate body between the governed and the governors, that is, between the Congress and the people. Let a continental conference be held, in the following manner and for the following purpose. A committee of twenty-six members of Congress, viz. two for each colony, two members from each House of Assembly or Provincial Convention, and five representatives of the people at large, to be chosen in the capital city or town of each province, for and in behalf of the whole province, by as many qualified voters as shall think proper to attend from all parts of the province for that purpose. Or, if more convenient, the representatives may be chosen in two or three of the most populous parts thereof. In this conference, thus assembled, will be united the two grand principles of business, knowledge and power. The members of Congress, assemblies, or conventions, by having had experience in national concerns, will be able and useful counselors, and the whole, being empowered by the people, will have a truly legal authority. The conferring members being met, let their business be to frame a continental charter, or charter of the United Colonies, answering to what is called the Magna Carta of England, fixing the number and manner of choosing members of Congress, members of Assembly, with their date of sitting, and drawing the line of business and jurisdiction between them. Always remembering 
that our strength is continental, not provincial, securing freedom and property to all men, and above all things the free exercise of religion, according to the dictates of conscience, with such other matter as is necessary for a charter to contain. Immediately after which, the said conference to dissolve, and the bodies which shall be chosen conformable to the said charter, to be the legislators and governors of this continent for the time being, whose peace and happiness may God preserve. Amen. Should any body of men be hereafter delegated for this or some similar purpose, I offer them the following extracts from that wise observer on government, Dragonetti. Quote, the science, says he, of the political consists in fixing the true point of happiness and freedom. Those men who deserve the gratitude of ages, who should discover a mode of government that contains the greatest sum of individual happiness with the least national expense. Close quote. But where, says some, is the king of America? I tell you, friend, he reigns above, and doth not make havoc of mankind like the royal brute of Britain. Yet, that we may not appear to be defective even in earthly honors, let a day be solemnly set apart for proclaiming the charter. Let it be brought forth placed on the divine law, the word of God. Let a crown be placed thereon, by which the world may know that so far as we approve of monarchy, that in America the law is king. For as in absolute governments the king is law, so in free countries the law ought to be king, and there ought to be no other. But lest any ill use should afterwards arise, let the crown at the conclusion of the ceremony be demolished, and scattered among the people whose right it is. A government of our own is our natural right, and when a man seriously reflects on the precariousness of human affairs, he will become convinced that it is infinitely wiser and safer to form a constitution of our own in a cool, deliberate manner, while we have it in our power, than to trust such an interesting event to time and chance. If we omit it now, some Massanello may hereafter arise, who, laying hold of popular disquietudes, may collect together the desperate and the discontented, and by assuming to themselves the powers of government, may sweep away the liberties of the continent like a deluge. Should the government of America return again into the hands of Britain, the tottering situation of things will be a temptation for some desperate adventurer to try his fortune. And, in such a case, what relief can Britain give? Ere she could hear the news, the fatal business might be done, and ourselves suffering like the wretched Britons under the oppression of the conqueror. Ye that oppose independence now, ye know not what ye do. Ye are opening a door to eternal tyranny by keeping vacant the seat of government. There are thousands and tens of thousands who would think it glorious to expel from the continent that barbarous and hellish power which hath stirred up the Indians and Negroes to destroy us. The cruelty hath a double guilt. It is dealing brutally by us and treacherously by them." To talk of friendship with those in whom our reason forbids us to have faith, and our affections, wounded through a thousand pores, instruct us to detest, is madness and folly. Every day wears out the little remains of kindred between us and them, and can there be any reason to hope that, as the relationship expires, the affection will increase? or that we shall agree better when we have ten times more and greater concerns to quarrel over than ever. Ye that tell us of harmony and reconciliation, can ye restore to us the time that is past? Can ye give to prostitution its former innocence? 
neither can ye reconcile Britain and America. The last cord now is broken. The people of England are presenting addresses against us. There are injuries which nature cannot forgive. She would cease to be nature if she did. As well can the lover forgive the ravisher of his mistress, as the continent forgive the murders of Britain. The Almighty hath implanted in us these unextinguishable feelings for good and wise purposes. They are the guardians of His image in our hearts. They distinguish us from the herd of common animals. The social compact would dissolve and justice be extirpated the earth, or have only a casual existence were we callous to the touches of affection. The robber and the murderer would often escape unpunished did not the injuries which our tippers sustain provoke us into justice. O oh, ye that love mankind, ye that dare oppose not only the tyranny, but the tyrant, stand forth. Every spot of the old world is overrun with oppression. Freedom hath been hunted round the globe. Asia and Africa have long expelled her. Europe regards her like a stranger, and England hath given her warning to depart. Oh, receive the fugitive, and prepare in time an asylum for mankind. End of Part 4《Part Five of Common Sense by Thomas Paine. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the present ability of America, with some miscellaneous reflections. I have never met with a man, either in England or in America, who hath not confessed his opinion that a separation between the countries would take place one time or another. And there is no instance in which we have shown less judgment than in endeavoring to describe what we call the ripeness or fitness of the continent for independence. As all men allow the measure, and vary only in their opinion of the time, let us, in order to remove mistakes, take a general survey of things, and endeavor, if possible, to find out the very time. But we need not go far. The inquiry ceases at once. For the time hath found us. The general concurrence, the glorious union of all things, prove the fact. It is not in numbers, but in unity, that our great strength lies. Yet our present numbers are sufficient to repel the force of all the world. The continent hath, at this time, the largest body of armed and disciplined men of any power under heaven, and is just arrived at that pitch of strength in which no single colony is able to support itself, and the whole, when united, can accomplish the matter, and either more or less than this might be fatal in its effects. Our land force is already sufficient, and as to naval affairs, we cannot be insensible that Britain would never suffer an American man of war to be built while the continent remained in her hands. Wherefore, we should be no forwarder an hundred years hence in that branch than we are now. But the truth is, we should be less so, because the timber of the country is every day diminishing, and that which will remain at last will be far off and difficult to procure. Were the continent crowded with inhabitants, her sufferings under the present circumstances would be intolerable. The more seaport towns we had, the more we should have both to defend and to lose. Our present numbers are so happily proportioned to our wants that no man need be idle. The diminution of trade affords an army, and the necessities of an army creates a new trade. Debts we have none, and whatever we may contract on this account, 
will serve as a glorious memento of our virtue. Can we but leave posterity with a settled form of government, an independent constitution of its own, the purchase at any price will be cheap. But to expend millions for the sake of getting a few vile acts repealed, and routing the present ministry only is unworthy the charge, and is using posterity with the utmost cruelty, because it is leaving them the great work to do, and a debt upon their backs from which they derive no advantage. Such a thought is unworthy of a man of honor, and is the true characteristic of a narrow heart and a peddling politician. The debt we may contract doth not deserve our regard, if the work be but accomplished. No nation ought to be without a debt. A national debt is a national bond, and when it bears no interest, is in no case a grievance. Britain is oppressed with a debt of upwards of one hundred and forty millions sterling, for which she pays upwards of four millions interest, and as a compensation for her debt she has a large navy. America is without debt and without a navy, yet for the twentieth part of the English national debt could have a navy as large again. The navy of England is not worth at this time more than three millions and a half sterling. The first and second editions of this pamphlet were published without the following calculations, which are now given as a proof that the above estimation of the navy is just. The charge of building a ship of each rate, and furnishing her with masts, yards, sails, and rigging, together with a proportion of eight months' boatswains and carpenters' sea stores, as calculated by Mr. Burchett, Secretary of the Navy. For a ship of one hundred guns, pound sterling, thirty-five thousand five fifty-three. Ninety guns, twenty-nine thousand eight eighty-six. Eighty guns, twenty-three thousand six thirty-eight. Seventy guns, seventeen thousand seven hundred ninety-five. Sixty guns, fourteen thousand one hundred ninety seven. Fifty guns, ten thousand six hundred six. Forty guns, seven thousand five hundred fifty eight. Thirty guns, five thousand eight hundred forty six. Twenty guns, three thousand seven hundred and ten. And from hence it is easy to sum up the value, or cost rather, of the whole British navy, which in the year 1757, when it was at its greatest glory, consisted of the following ships and guns. Six ships, a hundred guns. Cost of one, thirty-five thousand five hundred and fifty-three. Cost of all, two hundred and thirteen thousand three hundred and eighteen. Twelve ships of ninety guns. Cost of one, twenty-nine thousand eight hundred and eighty-six. Cost of all, three hundred and fifty-eight thousand six hundred thirty-two. Twelve ships of eighty guns, cost of one, twenty-three thousand six hundred and thirty-eight. Cost of all, two hundred and eighty-three thousand six hundred and fifty-six. Forty-three ships of seventy guns, cost of one, seventeen thousand seven hundred and eighty-five. Cost of all, seven hundred and sixty-four thousand seven hundred and fifty-five. Thirty-five ships of sixty guns, cost of one fourteen thousand one hundred ninety-seven, cost of all four hundred ninety-six thousand eight hundred ninety-five. Forty ships of fifty guns, cost of one ten thousand six hundred and six, cost of all four hundred twenty-four thousand two hundred and forty. Forty-five ships of forty guns, cost of one seven thousand five hundred and fifty-eight. Cost of all, three hundred and forty thousand one hundred and ten. Fifty-eight ships of twenty guns. Cost of one, three thousand seven hundred and ten. Cost of all, two hundred and fifteen thousand one hundred eighty. Eighty-five sloops, bombs, and fire ships, one with another. Cost of one, two thousand. Cost of all, one hundred and seventy thousand. Total cost, three million two hundred and sixty six thousand seven hundred and eighty six. Remains for guns, 
233,214. Cost of all, 3,500,000. No country on the globe is so happily situated or so internally capable of raising a fleet as America. Tar, timber, iron, and cordage are her natural produce. We need go abroad for nothing, whereas the Dutch, who make large profits by hiring out their ships of war to the Spaniards and Portuguese, are obliged to import most of their materials they use. We ought to view the building of fleet as an article of commerce, it being the natural manufactory of this country. It is the best money we can lay out. A navy, when finished, is worth more than it cost, and is that nice point in national policy in which commerce and protection are united. Let us build. If we want them not, we can sell, and by that means replace our paper currency with ready gold and silver. In point of manning a fleet, people in general run into great errors. It is not necessary that one-fourth part should be sailors. The terrible privateer, Captain Death, stood the hottest engagement of any ship last year, yet had not twenty sailors on board, though her complement of men was upwards of two hundred. A few able and social sailors will soon instruct a sufficient number of active landmen in the common work of a ship. Wherefore, we never can be more capable to begin on maritime matters than now, while our timber is standing, our fisheries blocked up, and our sailors and shipwrights out of employ. Men of war of seventy and eighty guns were built forty years ago in New England, and why not the same now? Shipbuilding is America's greatest pride, and in which she will in time excel the whole world. The great empires of the East are mostly inland, and consequently excluded from the possibility of rivaling her. Africa is in a state of barbarism, and no power in Europe hath either such an extent of coast or such an internal supply of materials. Where nature hath given the one, she has withheld the other. To America only hath she been liberal on both. The vast empire of Russia is almost shut out from the sea, wherefore her boundless forests, her tar, iron, and cordage, are only articles of commerce. In point of safety, ought we be without a fleet? We are not the little people now, which we were sixty years ago. At that time we might have trusted our property in the streets, or fields, rather, and slept securely without locks or bolts to our doors or windows. The case now is altered, and our methods of defense ought to improve with our increase of property. A common pirate twelve months ago might have come up the Delaware and laid the city of Philadelphia under instant contribution, for what sum he pleased, and the same might have happened to other places. Nay, any daring fellow in a brig of fourteen or sixteen guns might have robbed the whole continent and carried off half a million of money. These are circumstances which demand our attention and point out the necessity of naval protection. Some, perhaps, will say that after we have made it up with Britain, she will protect us. Can we be so unwise as to mean that she shall keep a navy in our harbors for that purpose? Common sense will tell us that the power which hath endeavored to subdue us is of all others the most improper to defend us. Conquest may be effected under the pretense of friendship, and ourselves, after a long and brave resistance, be at last cheated into slavery. And if her ships are not to be admitted into our harbors, I would ask, how is she to protect us? A navy three or four thousand miles off can be of little use, and on sudden emergencies none at all. Wherefore, if we must hereafter protect ourselves, why not do it for ourselves? 
The English list of ships of war is long and formidable, but not a tenth part of them are at any one time fit for service, numbers of them not in being, yet their names are pompously continued in the list, if only a plank be left of the ship, and not a fifth part of such as are fit for service can be spared on any one station at one time. The East and West Indies, Mediterranean, Africa, and other parts over which Britain extends her claim, make large demands upon her navy. From a mixture of prejudice and inattention, we have contracted a false notion respecting the navy of England, and have talked as if we should have the whole of it to encounter at once, and for that reason supposed that we must have one as large which, not being instantly practicable, have been made use of by a set of disguised Tories to discourage our beginning thereon. Nothing can be farther from the truth than this. For if America had only a twentieth part of the naval force of Britain, she would be by far an overmatch for her, because as we neither have nor claim any foreign dominion, our whole force would be employed on our own coast, where we should, in the long run, have two to one the advantage of those who had three or four thousand miles to sail over before they could attack us, and the same distance to return in order to refit and recruit. And although Britain, by her fleet, hath a check over our trade to Europe, we have as large a one over her trade to the West Indies, which, by laying in the neighborhood of the continent, is entirely at its mercy. Some method might be fallen on to keep up a navy force in time of peace, if we should not judge it necessary to support a constant navy. If premiums were to be given to merchants to build and employ in their service ships mounted with twenty, thirty, forty, or fifty guns, the premiums to be in proportion to the loss of bulk to the merchants, Fifty or sixty of those ships, with a few guard ships on constant duty, would keep up a sufficient navy, and that without burdening ourselves with the evil so loudly complained of in England, of suffering their fleet, in time of peace, to lie rotting in the docks. To unite the sinews of commerce and defense is sound policy, for when our strength and our riches play into each other's hand, we need fear no external enemy. In almost every article of defense we abound. Hemp flourishes even to rightness, so that we need not want cordage. Our iron is superior to that of other countries, our small arms equal to any in the world. Cannon we can cast at pleasure. Saltpeter and gunpowder we are every day producing. Our knowledge is hourly improving. Resolution is our inherent character, and courage hath never yet forsaken us. Wherefore, what is it that we want? Why is it that we hesitate? From Britain we can expect nothing but ruin. If she is once admitted to the government of America again, this continent will not be worth living in. Jealousies will be always rising, insurrections will be constantly happening, and who will go forth to quell them? Who will venture his life to reduce his own countrymen to a foreign obedience? The difference between Pennsylvania and Connecticut, respecting some unlocated lands, shows the insignificance of a British government, and fully proves that nothing but continental authority can regulate continental matters. Another reason why the present time is preferable to all others is that the fewer our numbers are, the more land there is yet unoccupied, which, instead of being lavished by the king on his worthless dependents, may be hereafter applied not only to the discharge of the present debt, but to the constant support of our government. No nation under heaven hath such an advantage at this. The infant state of the colonies, as it is called, so far from being against, is an argument in favor of independence. We are sufficiently numerous, and were we more so, 
we might be less united. It is a matter worthy of observation that the more a country is peopled, the smaller their armies are. In military numbers the ancients far exceeded the moderns, and the reason is evident. For trade being the consequence of population, men become too much absorbed thereby to attend to anything else. Commerce diminishes the spirit, both of patriotism and military defense, and history sufficiently informs us that the bravest achievements were always accomplished in the non-age of a nation. With the increase of commerce, England hath lost its spirit. The city of London, notwithstanding its numbers, submits to continued insults with the patience of a coward. The more men have to lose, the less willing they are to venture. The rich are in general slaves to fear, and submit to courtly power with the trembling duplicity of a spaniel. Youth is the seed-time of good habits as well in nations as in individuals. It might be difficult, if not impossible, to form the continent into one government half a century hence. The vast variety of interests occasioned by an increase of trade and population would create confusion. Colony would be against colony. Each being able might scorn each other's assistance. And while the proud and foolish gloried in their little distinctions, the wise would lament that the Union had not been formed before. Wherefore, the present time is the true time for establishing it. The intimacy which is contracted in infancy, and the friendship which is formed in misfortune, are, of all others, the most lasting and unalterable. Our present union is marked with both these characters. We are young, and we have been distressed. But our concord hath withstood our troubles, and fixes a memorable area for posterity to glory in. The present time, likewise, is that peculiar time which never happens to a nation but once, viz., the time of forming itself into a government. Most nations have let slip the opportunity, and by that means have been compelled to receive laws from their conquerors, instead of making laws for themselves. First they had a king, and then a form of government, whereas the articles or charter of government should be formed first, and men delegated to execute them afterward. But from the errors of other nations let us learn wisdom, and lay hold of the present opportunity to begin government at the right end. When William the Conqueror subdued England, he gave them law at the point of a sword, and until we consent that the seat of government in America be legally and authoritatively occupied, we shall be in danger of having it filled by some fortunate ruffian who may treat us in the same manner, and then where will be our freedom, where our property? As to religion, I hold it to be the indispensable duty of all government to protect all conscientious professors thereof, and I know of no other business which government hath to do therewith. Let a man throw aside that narrowness of soul, that selfishness of principle, which the niggards of all professions are so unwilling to part with, and he will be delivered of his fears on that head. Suspicion is the companion of mean souls, and the bane of all good society. For myself, I fully and conscientiously believe that it is the will of the Almighty that there should be diversity of religious opinions among us. It affords a larger feel for our Christian kindness. Were we all of one way of thinking, our religious dispositions would want matter for probation, and on this liberal principle I look on the various denominations among us to be like children of the same family, differing only in what is called their Christian names. In page 40 I threw out a few thoughts on the propriety of a continental charter, for I only presume to offer hints, not plans, and in this place I take the liberty of re-mentioning the subject, 
by observing that a charter is to be understood as a bond of solemn obligation, which the whole enters into to support the right of every separate part, whether of religion, personal freedom, or property. A firm bargain and a right reckoning makes long friends. In a former page I likewise mentioned the necessity for a large and equal representation, and there is no political matter which more deserves our attention. A small number of electors or a small number of representatives are equally dangerous. But if the number of the representatives be not only small but unequal, the danger is increased. As an instance of this, I mention the following. When the Associator's petition was before the House of Assembly of Pennsylvania, twenty-eight members only were present, all the Bucks County members being eight voted against it, and, had seven of the Chester members done the same, the whole province had been governed by two counties only, and this danger it is always exposed to. The unwarrantable stretch likewise, which that house made in their last sitting, to gain an undue authority over the delegates of that province, or to warn the people at large how they trust power out of their own hands. A set of instructions to the delegates were put together, which in point of sense and business would have dishonored a schoolboy, and, after being approved by a few, a very few, without doors, were carried into the house, and there passed in behalf of the whole colony. Whereas did the whole colony know with what ill will that house hath entered on some necessary public measures, they would not hesitate a moment to think them unworthy of such a trust. Immediate necessity makes many things convenient, which, if continued, would grow into oppression. Expedience and right are different things. When the calamities of America required a consultation, there was no method so ready, or at that time so proper, as to appoint persons from the several houses of assembly for that purpose, and the wisdom with which they have proceeded hath preserved this continent from ruin. But as it is more than probable that we shall never be without a Congress, every well-wisher to good order must own that the mode for choosing members of that body deserves consideration. And I put it as a question to those who make a study of mankind, whether representation and election is not too great a power for one and the same body of men to possess. When we are planning for posterity, we ought to remember that virtue is not hereditary. It is from our enemies that we often gain excellent maxims, and are frequently surprised into reason by their mistakes. Mr. Cornwall, one of the Lords of the Treasury, treated the petition of the New York Assembly with contempt, because that house, he said, consisted but of twenty-six members, which trifling number, he argued, could not with decency be put for the whole. We thank him for his involuntary honesty. To conclude, however strange it may appear to some, or how unwilling they may be to think so, matters not. But many strong and striking reasons may be given to show that nothing can settle our affairs so expeditiously as an open and determined declaration for independence, some of which are, first, it is the custom of nations when any two are at war, or some other powers not engaged in the quarrel, to step in as mediators and bring about the preliminaries of a peace. But while America calls herself the subject of Great Britain, no power, however well disposed she may be, can offer her mediation. Wherefore, in our present state, we may quarrel on for ever. Secondly, it is unreasonable to suppose that France or Spain will give us any kind of assistance, if we mean only to make use of that assistance for the purpose of repairing the breach and strengthening the connection between Britain and America, because those powers would be sufferers by the consequences. Thirdly, 
While we profess ourselves the subjects of Britain, we must, in the eye of foreign nations, be considered as rebels. The precedent is somewhat dangerous to their peace, for men to be in arms under the name of subjects. We, on the spot, can solve the paradox, but to unite resistance and subjection requires an idea much too refined for common understanding. Fourthly, were a manifesto to be published and dispatched to foreign courts, setting forth the miseries we have endured and the peaceable methods we have ineffectually used for redress, declaring at the same time that not being able any longer to live happily or safely under the cruel disposition of the British court, we had been driven to the necessity of breaking off all connections with her, at the same time, assuring all such courts of our peaceable disposition toward them, and of our desire of entering into trade with them, such a memorial would produce more good effects to this continent than if a ship were freighted with petitions to Britain. Under our present denomination of British subjects, we can neither be received nor heard abroad. The custom of all courts is against us, and will be so until— by an independence we take rank with other nations. These proceedings may at first appear strange and difficult, but, like all other steps which we have already passed over, will in a little time become familiar and agreeable, and until an independence is declared, the continent will feel itself like a man who continues putting off some unpleasant business from day to day, yet knows it must be done, hates to set about it, wishes it over, and is continually haunted with the thoughts of its necessity. End of Part 5 Part 6 of Common Sense by Thomas Paine This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 6 Appendix since the publication of the first edition of this pamphlet, or rather on the same day on which it came out, the King's Speech made its appearance in this city. Had the spirit of prophecy directed the birth of this production, it could not have brought it forth at a more seasonable juncture or a more necessary time. The bloody-mindedness of the one showed the necessity of pursuing the doctrine of the other. Men read by way of revenge, and this speech, instead of terrifying, prepared a way for the manly principles of independence. Ceremony, or even silence, from whatever motive they may arise, have a hurtful tendency when they give the least degree of countenance to base and wicked performances. Wherefore, if this maxim be admitted, it naturally follows that the king's speech, as being a piece of finished villainy, deserved, and still deserves, a general execration both by the Congress and the people. Yet, as the domestic tranquillity of a nation depends greatly on the chastity of what may properly be called national manners, it is often better to pass some things over in silent disdain than to make use of such new methods of dislike as might introduce the least innovation on that guardian of our peace and safety. And perhaps it is chiefly owing to this prudent delicacy that the King's speech hath not, before now, suffered a public execution. The speech, if it may be called one, is nothing better than a willful, audacious libel against the truth, the common good, and the existence of mankind, and is a formal and pompous method of offering up human sacrifices to the pride of tyrants. But this general massacre of mankind is one of the privileges and the certain consequence of kings, for as nature knows them not, they know not her, and although they are beings of our own creating, they know not us and are become the gods of their creators. The speech hath one good quality, which is, that it is not calculated to deceive, 
Neither can we, even if we would, be deceived by it. Brutality and tyranny appear on the face of it. It leaves us at no loss. And every line convinces, even in the moment of reading, that he who hunts the woods for prey, the naked and untutored Indian, is less a savage than the King of Britain. Sir John Darrymple, the putative father of a whining Jesuitical piece, fallaciously called The Address of the People of England to the Inhabitants of America, hath perhaps, from a vain supposition that the people here were to be frightened at the pomp and description of a king, given, though very unwisely on his part, the real character of the present one. But, says this writer, if you are inclined to pay compliments to an administration which we do not complain of, meaning the Marquis of Rockingham's at the repeal of the Stamp Act, it is very unfair in you to withhold them from that prince by whose nod alone they were permitted to do anything. This is Toryism with a witness. Here is idolatry even without a mask. And he who can calmly hear and digest such a doctrine hath forfeited his claim to rationality and apostate from the order of manhood and ought to be considered as one who hath not only given up the proper dignity of man, but sunk himself beneath the rank of animals, and contemptibly crawl through the world like a worm. However, it matters very little now what the King of England either says or does. He hath wickedly broken through every moral and human obligation, trampled nature and conscience beneath his feet, and by a steady and constitutional spirit of insolence and cruelty procured for himself an universal hatred. It is now the interest of America to provide for herself. She hath already a large and young family, whom it is more her duty to take care of than to be granting away her property to support a power who has become a reproach to the names of men and Christians ye whose office it is to watch over the morals of a nation of whatsoever sect or denomination ye are of as well as ye who are more immediately the guardians of the public liberty if ye wish to preserve your native country uncontaminated by european corruption ye must in secret wish a separation but leaving the moral part to private reflection i shall chiefly confine my further remarks to the following heads First, that it is the interest of America to be separated from Britain. Secondly, which is the easiest and most practicable plan, reconciliation or independence, with some occasional remarks. In support of the first, I could, if I judged it proper, produce the opinion of some of the ablest and most experienced men on this continent, and whose sentiments on that head are not yet publicly known. It is, in reality, a self-evident position, for no nation in a state of foreign dependence, limited in its commerce and cramped and fettered in its legislative powers, can ever arrive at any material eminence. America doth not yet know what opulence is, and although the progress which she hath made stands unparalleled in the history of other nations, it is but childhood compared with what she would be capable of arriving at, had she, as she ought to have, the legislative powers in her own hands. England is, at this time, proudly coveting what would do her no good were she to accomplish it, and the continent hesitating on a matter which will be her final ruin if neglected. It is the commerce and not the conquest of America by which England is to be benefited and that would, in a great measure, continue, were the countries as independent of each other as France and Spain, because in many articles neither can go to a better market. But it is the independence of this country of Britain, or any other, which is now the main and only object worthy of contention, and which, like all other truths discovered by necessity, will appear clearer and stronger every day. First, 
because it will come to that one time or other. Secondly, because the longer it is delayed, the harder it will be to accomplish. I have frequently amused myself, both in public and private companies, with silently remarking the specious errors of those who speak without reflecting. And among the many which I have heard, the following seems the most general, viz., that had this rupture happened forty or fifty years hence, instead of now, the continent would have been more able to have shaken off the dependence. To which I reply that our military ability at this time arises from the experience gained in the last war, and which in forty or fifty years' time would have been totally extinct. The continent would not by that time have had a general or even a military officer left, and we or those who may succeed us would have been as ignorant of martial affairs as the ancient Indians. And this single position, closely attended to, will unanswerably prove that the present time is preferable to all others. The argument turns thus. At the conclusion of the last war, we had experience, but wanted numbers and forty or fifty years hence we should have numbers without experience. Wherefore the proper point of time must be some particular point between the two extremes, in which a sufficiency of the former remains, and a proper increase of the latter is obtained, and that point of time is the present time. The reader will pardon this digression, as it does not properly come under the head I first set out with, and to which I again return by the following position, viz. Should affairs be patched up with Britain, and she to remain the governing and sovereign power of America, which, as matters are now circumstanced, is giving up the point entirely, we shall deprive ourselves of the very means of sinking the debt we have or may contract. The value of the back lands which some of the provinces are clandestinely deprived of, by the unjust extension of the limits of Canada, valued only at five pounds sterling per hundred acres, amounts to upwards of twenty-five millions Pennsylvania currency, and the quit-rents at one penny sterling per acre to two millions yearly. It is by the sale of those lands that the debt may be sunk without burden to any, and the quit-rent reserved thereon will always lessen, and in time will wholly support the yearly expense of government. It matters not how long the debt is in paying, so that the lands, when sold, be applied to the discharge of it, and for the execution of which the Congress for the time being will be the Continental Trustees. I proceed now to the second head, viz., which is the easiest and most practicable plan, reconciliation or independence, with some occasional remarks. He who takes nature for his guide is not easily beaten out of his argument, and on that ground I answer generally that independence, being a single simple line contained within ourselves, and reconciliation a matter exceedingly perplexed and complicated, and in which a treacherous, capricious court is to interfere, gives the answer without a doubt. The present state of America is truly alarming to every man who is capable of reflection. Without law, without government, without any other mode of power than what is founded on and granted by courtesy held together by an unexampled concurrence of sentiment, which is nevertheless subject to change, and which every secret enemy is endeavouring to dissolve. Our present condition is legislation without law, wisdom without a plan, a constitution without a name, and, what is strangely astonishing, perfect independence contending for dependence. The instance is without a precedent, the case never existing before, and who can tell what may be the event? The property of no man is secure in the present unbraced system of things. The mind of the multitude is left at random, 
and seeing no fixed object before them, they pursue such as fancy or opinion starts. Nothing is criminal, there is no such thing as treason, wherefore every one thinks himself at liberty to act as he pleases. The Tories dared not have assembled offensively, had they known that their lives, by that act, were forfeited to the laws of the state. A line of distinction should be drawn between English soldiers taken in battle and inhabitants of America taken in arms. The first are prisoners, but the latter traitors. The one forfeits his liberty, the other his head. Notwithstanding our wisdom, there is a visible feebleness in some of our proceedings which give encouragement to dissensions. The continental belt is too loosely buckled, and if something is not done in time it will be too late to do anything, and we shall fall into a state in which neither reconciliation nor independence will be practicable. The king and his worthless adherents are got at their old game of dividing the continent, and there are not wanting among us printers who will be busy in spreading specious falsehoods. The artful and hypocritical letter which appeared a few months ago in two of the New York papers, and likewise in two others, is an evidence that there are men who want either judgment or honesty. It is easy getting into holes and corners and talking of reconciliation, but do such men seriously consider how difficult the task is, and how dangerous it may prove should the continent divide thereon? Do they take within their view all the various orders of men whose situation and circumstances, as well as their own, are to be considered therein? Do they put themselves in the place of the sufferer whose all is already gone, and of the soldier who hath quitted all for the defense of his country? If their ill-judged moderation be suited to their own private situations only, regardless of others, the event will convince them that they are reckoning without their host. Put us, says some, on the footing we were on in sixty-three, to which I answer, the request is not now in the power of Britain to comply with, neither will she propose it. But if it were, and even should be granted, I ask as a reasonable question, by what means is such a corrupt and faithless court to be kept to its engagements? Another Parliament, nay, even the present, may hereafter repeal the obligation, on the pretense of its being violently obtained, or unwisely granted, and in that case, where is our redress? No going to law with nations. Cannon are the barristers of crowns, and the sword, not of justice, but of war, decides the suit. To be on the footing of sixty-three, it is not sufficient that the laws only be put on the same state, but that our circumstances likewise be put on the same state. Our burnt and destroyed towns repaired or built up, our private losses made good, our public debts, contracted for defense, discharged. Otherwise we shall be millions worse than we were at that enviable period. Such a request, had it been complied with a year ago, would have won the heart and soul of the continent, but now it is too late. The Rubicon is past. Besides, the taking up arms, merely to enforce the repeal of a pecuniary law, seems as unwarrantable by the divine law, and as repugnant to human feelings, as the taking up arms to enforce obedience thereto. The object on either side doth not justify the means, for the lives of men are too valuable to be cast away on such trifles. It is the violence which is done and threatened to our persons, the destruction of our property by an armed force, the invasion of our country by fire and sword, which conscientiously qualifies the use of arms. And the incident in which such a mode of defense became necessary, all subjection to Britain ought to have ceased, 
and the independence of America should have been considered as dating in era form and published by the first musket that was fired against her. This line is a line of consistency, neither drawn by caprice nor extended by ambition, but produced by a chain of events of which the colonies were not the authors. I shall conclude these remarks with the following timely and well-intended hints. We ought to reflect that there are three different ways by which an independency may hereafter be effected, and that one of these three will one day or other be the fate of America, viz., by the legal voice of the people in Congress, by a military power, or by a mob. It may not always happen that our soldiers are citizens, and the multitude a body of reasonable men. Virtue, as I have already remarked, is not hereditary, neither is it perpetual. Should an independency be brought about by the first of those means, we have every opportunity, and every encouragement before us, to form the noblest, purest constitution on the face of the earth. We have it in our power to begin the world over again. A situation similar to the present hath not happened since the days of Noah until now. The birthday of a new world is at hand, and a race of men, perhaps as numerous as all Europe contains, are to receive their portion of freedom from the event of a few months. The reflection is awful, and in this point of view, how trifling, how ridiculous, do the little, paltry cavillings of a few weak or interested men appear when weighted against the business of a world. Should we neglect the present favorable and inviting period, and an independency be hereafter effected by any other means, we must charge the consequence to ourselves, or to those, rather, whose narrow and prejudiced souls or habitually opposing the measure without either inquiring or reflecting. There are reasons to be given in support of independence which men should rather privately think of than be publicly told of. We ought not now to be debating whether we shall be independent or not, but anxious to accomplish it on a firm, secure, and honorable basis, and uneasy rather that it is not yet began upon. Every day convinces us of its necessity. Even the Tories, if such beings yet remain among us, should, of all men, be the most solicitous to promote it. For, as the appointment of committees at first protected them from popular rage, so a wise and well-established form of government will be the only certain means of continuing it securely to them. Wherefore, if they have not virtue enough to be Whigs, they ought to have prudence enough to wish for independence. In short, independence is the only bond that can tie and keep us together. We shall then see our object, and our ears will be legally shut against the schemes of an intriguing as well as a cruel enemy. We shall then, too, be on a proper footing to treat with Britain. For there is reason to conclude that the pride of that court will be less hurt by treating with the American states for terms of peace than with those whom she dominates, rebellious subjects, for terms of accommodation. It is our delaying it that encourages her to hope for conquest, and our backwardness tends only to prolong the war. As we have, without any good effect therefrom, withheld our trade to obtain a redress of our grievances, let us now try the alternative, by independently redressing them ourselves, and then offering to open the trade. The mercantile and reasonable part in England will still be with us, because peace with trade is preferable to war without it. And if this offer be not accepted, other courts may be applied to. On these grounds I rest the matter. And as no offer hath yet been made to refute the doctrine contained in the former editions of this pamphlet, it is a negative proof that either the doctrine cannot be refuted, or 
that the party in favor of it are too numerous to be opposed. Wherefore, instead of gazing at each other with suspicion or doubtful curiosity, let each of us hold out to his neighbor the hearty hand of friendship, and unite in drawing a line which, like an act of oblivion, shall bury in forgetfulness every former dissension. Let the names of Whig and Tory be extinct, and let none other be heard among us than those of a good citizen, an open and resolute friend, and a virtuous supporter of the rights of mankind and of the free and independent states of America. To the representatives of the religious society of the people called Quakers, or to so many of them as were concerned in publishing the late piece entitled, quote, The Ancient Testimony and Principles of the People Called Quakers Renewed, with respect to the King and Government, and touching the commotions now prevailing in these and other parts of America, addressed to the people in general, close quote. The writer of this is one of those few who never dishonors religion either by ridiculing or cavilling at any denomination whatsoever. To God, and not to man, are all men accountable on the score of religion. Wherefore, this epistle is not so properly addressed to you as a religious, but as a political body, dabbling in matters which the professed quietude of your principles instruct you not to meddle with. As you have, without a proper authority for so doing, put yourselves in the place of the whole body of the Quakers, so the writer of this, in order to be on an equal rank with yourselves, is under the necessity of putting himself in the place of all those who approve the very writings and principles against which your testimony is directed. And he hath chosen this singular situation in order that you might discover in him that presumption of character which you cannot see in yourselves. For neither he nor you can have any claim or title to political representation. When men have departed from the right way, it is no wonder that they stumble and fall. And it is evident that the manner in which ye have managed your testimony, that politics, as a religious body of men, is not your proper walk, for however well adapted it might appear to you, it is nevertheless a jumble of good and bad put unwisely together, and the conclusion drawn therefrom both unnatural and unjust. The first two pages, and the whole doth not make four, we give you credit for, and expect the same civility from you, because the love and desire of peace is not confined to Quakerism, it is the natural as well the religious wish of all denominations of men and on this ground as men laboring to establish an independent constitution of our own do we exceed all others in our hope end and aim our plan is peace for ever we are tired of contention with britain and can see no real end to it but in a final separation we act consistently because for the sake of introducing an endless and uninterrupted peace do we bear the evils and burdens of the present day. We are endeavoring, and will steadily continue to endeavor, to separate and dissolve a connection which hath already filled our land with blood, and which, while the name of it remains, will be the fatal cause of future mischiefs to both countries. We fight neither for revenge nor conquest, neither from pride nor passion. We are not insulting the world with our fleets and armies, nor ravaging the globe for plunder. Beneath the shade of our own vines are we attacked. In our own houses and on our own lands is the violence committed against us. We view our enemies in the character of highwaymen and housebreakers, and having no defense for ourselves in the civil law, are obliged to punish them by the military one, and apply the sword in the very case where you have before now applied the halter. Perhaps we feel for the ruined and insulted sufferers in all and every part of the continent, 
with a degree of tenderness which hath not yet made its way into some of your bosoms, but be ye sure that ye mistake not the cause and ground of your testimony. Call not coldless of soul religion, nor put the bigot in the place of the Christian. O oh, ye partial ministers of your own acknowledged principles, if the bearing arms be sinful, the first going to war must be more so by all the difference between willful attack and unavoidable defense. Wherefore, if ye really preach from conscience, and mean not to make a political hobby-horse of your religion, convince the world thereof by proclaiming your doctrine to our enemies, for they likewise bear arms. Give us proof of your sincerity by publishing it at St. James, to the commanders-in-chief at Boston, to the admirals and captains, who are piratically ravaging our coasts, and to all the murdering miscreants who are acting in authority under him whom ye profess to serve. Had ye the honest soul of Barclay, ye would preach repentance to your king. Ye would tell the royal wretch his sins, and warn him of eternal ruin. Ye would not spend your partial invectives upon the injured and the insulted alone, but, like faithful ministers, would cry aloud and spare none. Say not that ye are persecuted, neither endeavor to make us the authors of that reproach which ye are bringing upon yourselves, for we testify unto all men that we do not complain against you because ye are Quakers, but because ye pretend to be, and are not Quakers. Alas, it seems by the particular tendency of some part of your testimony, and other parts of your conduct, as if all sin were reduced to and comprehended in the act of bearing arms, and that by the people only. Ye appear to us to have mistaken party for conscience, because the general tenor of your actions wants uniformity, and it is exceedingly difficult to us to give credit to many of your pretended scruples, because we see them made by the same men who, in the very instant that they are exclaiming against the mammon of the world, are nevertheless hunting after it with a step as steady as time, and an appetite as keen as death. The quotation which ye have made from Proverbs in the third page of your testimony, that, quote, when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him, close quote, is very unwisely chosen on your part, because it amounts to a proof that the king's ways, whom ye are desirous of supporting, do not please the Lord, otherwise his reign would be in peace. I now proceed to the latter part of your testimony, and that for which all the foregoing seems only an introduction, viz., quote, it hath ever been our judgment and principle, since we were called to profess the light of Christ Jesus, manifested in our consciences unto this day, that the setting up and putting down kings and governments is God's peculiar prerogative for causes best known to himself, and that it is not our business to have any hand or contrivance therein, nor to be busybodies above our station, much less to plod and contrive the ruin or overturn of any of them, but to pray for the king and safety of our nation and good of all men, that we may live a peaceable and quiet life in all godliness and honesty, under the government which God is pleased to set over us. Quote. If these are really your principles, why do ye not abide by them? Why do ye not leave that which ye call God's work to be managed by himself? These very principles instruct you to wait with patience and humility for the event of all public measures, and to receive that event as the divine will towards you. Wherefore, what occasion is there for your political testimony if you fully believe what it contains, and the very publishing it proves that either ye do not believe what ye profess, or have not virtue enough to practice what ye believe. 
The principles of Quakerism have a direct tendency to make a man the quiet and inoffensive subject of any and every government which is set over him. And if the setting up and putting down of kings and governments is God's peculiar prerogative, he most certainly will not be robbed thereof by us. Wherefore, the principle itself leads you to approve of everything which ever happened or may happen to kings as being his work. Oliver Cromwell thanks you. Charles, then, died not by the hands of men, and should the present proud imitator of him come to the same untimely end, the writers and publishers of the testimony are bound, by the doctrine it contains, to applaud the fact. Kings are not taken away by miracles. Neither are changes in governments brought about by any other means than such as are common and human, and such as we are now using. Even the dispersion of the Jews, though foretold by our Saviour, was affected by arms. Wherefore, as ye refuse to be the means on one side, you ought not to be meddlers on the other, but to wait the issue in silence, and unless ye can produce divine authority to prove that the Almighty who hath created and placed this new world at the greatest distance it could possibly stand east and west from every part of the old, doth nevertheless disapprove of its being independent of the corrupt and abandoned court of Britain, unless I say, ye can show this, how can ye on the ground of your principles justify the exciting and stirring up the people, quote, firmly to unite in the abhorrence of all such writings and measures, as evidence a desire and design to break off the happy connection we have hitherto enjoyed with the kingdom of Great Britain, and our just and necessary subordination to the king and those who are lawfully placed in authority under him. Close quote. What a slap of the face is here! The men, who in the very paragraph before, have quietly and passively resigned up the ordering, altering, and disposal of kings and governments into the hands of God, are now recalling their principles, and putting in for a share of the business. Is it possible that the conclusion, which is here justly quoted, can any ways follow from their doctrine laid down? The inconsistency is too glaring not to be seen, the absurdity too great not to be laughed at, and such as could only have been made by those whose understandings were darkened by the narrow and crabby spirit of a despairing political party, for ye are not to be considered as the whole body of the Quakers, but only as a fractional and fractional part thereof. Here ends the examination of your testimony, which I call upon no man to abhor, as ye have done, but only to read and judge of fairly to which I subjoin the following remark, quote, that the setting up and putting down of kings, close quote, most certainly mean the making him a king who is not yet so, and the making him no king who is already one. And pray, what hath this to do in the present case? We neither mean to set up nor to pull down, neither to make nor to unmake, but to have nothing to do with them. Wherefore your testimony, in whatever light it is viewed, serves only to dishonor your judgment, and for many other reasons had better have been let alone than published. First, because it tends to the decrease and reproach of all religion whatever, and is of the utmost danger to society to make it a party in political disputes. Secondly, because it exhibits a body of men numbers of whom disavow the publishing political testimonies, as being concerned therein and approves thereof. Thirdly, because it hath a tendency to undo that continental harmony and friendship which yourselves, by your late liberal and charitable donations, hath lent a hand to establish, and the preservation of which is of the utmost consequence to us all. And here, without anger or resentment, I bid you farewell, sincerely wishing that as men and Christians 
ye may always fully and uninterruptedly enjoy every civil and religious right, and be, in your turn, the means of securing it to others. But that the example which ye have unwisely set of mingling religion with politics may be disavowed and reprobated by every inhabitant of America. End of Part 6 End of Common Sense by Thomas Paine Read by Phil Chenevere